Our next speaker is also a, a local speaker from across the street here at UCI. Uh, we have the Vice Chair of Research and Academic Affairs from the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine. He is also a specialist in substance use and the opioid crisis. Please welcome Dr. Bharath Chakravarti. Right. We need a doctor to recess Bay A. We need a doctor to recess Bay A. Now, I'm an emergency physician. I've been doing this for 10 years. I don't really get excited about too much. Um, my life's pretty exciting, but you, get, you develop a level of tolerance. Um, and, but when my nurses yell that out, and I'm in the doctor's bay, you can see the level of excitement and enthusiasm. Everyone jumps up. Uh, our nurses don't cry wolf. We get out there into recess bay, and what do we find? Well, we find uh, someone who is altered. That means they're not uh, their normal selves. They're blue, they're cyanotic, and uh, they're not breathing. They have pinpoint pupils. Now, that's a pretty easy diagnosis for us to make, uh, given the setting that I'm in and the training that I've received. But the team gets together, um, and we give them that life-saving medication that you've heard before, naloxone, and they uh, improve. And uh, we see this all the time, unfortunately, in the emergency department. That's my setting. Um, I, I work there uh, three days a week in the ER. And it's unfortunate the number of overdoses that I see. Now, <clears throat> here you see depicted a needle and a syringe. But to be honest with you, this story transcends just illicit drug use. Uh, there's a lot of uh, unintentional overdoses, as you well know. We all have heard a little bit about where all of this came from historically. But the bottom line is this is the end result of a number of uh, systematic, personal, professional, and patient level choices. And uh, as, as all of these epidemics occur, there is a multifactorial etiology to all of this. But let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, problems a little bit of, the, of, of what's being done, and some of the barriers that, that you've all heard about. So I apologize if some of these slides may be redundant, but we'll go over them quickly. Number one, an estimated 1.8 million Americans have over, over, uh, opioid use disorder. Okay, That's kind of the common nomenclature that, that we all talk about in, in the space of addiction, opioid use disorder. 626,000 of those have heroin-related opioid use disorder. So a good majority of them are prescribed opioids. Estimated cost, ridiculously high. Opioid-related emergency department deaths, and what part of the whole healthcare system is the most expensive? The hospital, right? The emergency department, in hospitalization, the ICU. Now, um, we, we, don't, we don't want that to happen for a number of reasons, but at the patient level, we really don't want them to get to that point. 2.1 million people in the US, ages 12 and older, have opioid use disorder involving prescription opioids and heroin or both, right? There's a whole concept of the chicken and the egg. Are we priming people for illicit uh, drug use or are we substituting? It's probably a combination of both and maybe it doesn't matter so much as long as we recognize that it's complex. We all know that opioid addiction is not just about overdoses. There's a myriad of other issues that occur with them, uh, a lot of other um, uh, Chronic diseases can occur, as well as acute diseases, skin abscesses, endocarditis, hepatitis, you name it, and the years of potential life lost as a public health person, that's what we think about. We have a productive member of society who somehow ends up addicted or in, in the spectrum of opioid use disorder, who now is no longer functioning on a real level, holding down a job, building relationships in their community and their families, and being a productive member of society. And so we want to get those folks back to that position. We've seen a ridiculous increase in the number of in-hospital stays as well uh, with this whole epidemic. 
We just uh, heard from uh, uh, Tony Rakakis about uh, opioid addiction and illegal activity and incarceration and, and how that's all linked together. And again, stressing the need that we can't work in silos. You've heard this uh, probably a number of times. We have to really kind of work in a collaborative atmosphere to tackle this issue um, together. And that's easier said than done, um, but uh, that's, 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 that's the issue. You've seen this slide before. I've actually, I actually borrowed this slide uh, uh, from Matt before, so um, he gave a talk. Uh, at UCI maybe six months ago or so, and I borrowed this slide uh, from you and I kind of added a few points. But really, <clears throat> these are some of the things that we think about in that whole space of opioids from a public health perspective, right? We want to prevent. We want to start fewer opioids. We want to have shorter durations. So although we are prescribing less pills, the, num the, the actually strength of the pills may be um, more potent. And so we have to be cognizant of that. We want to think about upstream education, both at the patient level, at the primary care provider level, at the specialist level. This is really important. How about managing that whole pain? We don't want to just say no. We want to make sure that we offer out a solution to those who are in the spectrum of tolerance, abuse, addiction, whatever it may be. So alternative therapies, tapering high doses, limiting opioids and sedatives. That's extremely important when you talk about risk, okay? Um, how about treatment? Medication assistant treatment programs you've heard about. Reducing the stigma. There's a ridiculous amount of stigma out there um, for all of the teams. The, the stigma really is twofold. One is a societal stigma. Uh, two is uh, a provider stigma to engage in these types of conversations with our patients who we know we're probably over prescribing, who we know that probably has an issue. Um, it's hard, right? We're, we're physicians, we're providers. We don't want to always have a negative conversation with our patients. We want our patients to like us, right? We don't want to argue with our patients. There's a lot of other forces involved, including patient satisfaction scores and whatnot. But, but the bottom line is when we became physicians, when we became providers, we took the Hippocratic Oath. The main focus of the Hippocratic Oath is to do no harm, right? So if we just focus on that, and if that patient across from us is, if we think of them as our family member, we hope that we can engage that inner empathy uh, to, to do the right thing. But that stigma is hard. It's, it's hard to um, convince physicians to have that difficult conversation with patients. You know, my wife's a pediatrician, and anytime a kid comes with a parent about, for an earache, there's one thing that they want. Antibiotics, right? But we all know 75% of ear infections don't require antibiotics. But that's a hard conversation to have, the antibiotic stewardship. But we're more likely to have that because we don't want to have a discussion with Mr. Johnson or Mrs. Suarez or Mr. Patel, you know, to say, hey, uh, we think you might have an issue and a problem. Um, you know, that conversation is difficult to have, and we're not trained to have those conversations as easily. We need to, we need to uh, think about that stigma. We also we talk, stop, talked a little bit about stopping the, the end result, which is deaths, right? We want to keep people alive. We want to keep them, we want to reduce harm, and we want to make sure that we can then have those pool of patients to get them back to a productive, uh, 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 have, have them converted back to a, a, a productive person in society. So these are really, really important. Some of these topics are controversial to the general public, including supervised injection sites. But these are thoughts uh, and, and, and ideas that we should discuss and not just uh, sweep away. So th thinking about some of the um, uh, actionable items that many of the coalitions out there in California and beyond that look at is safer prescribing practices, right? So we created this infographic, really cool and, and wonderful. Great. It's awesome. <laughs> it gives the data. But if it stays on my shelf or in my computer, what difference does it make, right? So we want to measure the effectiveness, measure the penetrance. Are people using it? Are, are, is it making a difference? So evidence-based medicine and data is really important. And there's a lot of confounding in, in, in public health data. There's a lot of confounders. But we want to really focus on uh, smart objectives and deliverables. <laughs> alternatives, right? We talked about alternatives in, in treatment. Ibuprofen. I mean, this is my go-to. I go to Costco, get me a double you know, bag of ibuprofen. And every time I play basketball or tennis and my knees act up, that's what I'm going to. Um, 
so, you know, resetting that conversation, reinforcing that conversation to our patients, to, to our providers, I think is really important. You know, there's other uh, alternatives as well uh, for certain um, uh, chief complaints and disease processes like trigger point injections. You know, you have low back pain or, or, or point trigger pain. You know, trigger point injections, uh, believe it or not, are efficacious and they do work. What are we injecting in there? You can inject whatever you want. In fact, you don't even need to inject anything. The fact of the matter is, and I don't know how the science works, but actually putting a needle into that spot that hurts the most and just injecting saline water actually is more helpful than prescribing medications. Um, we also spoke a little bit about um, cannabinoids and CBD, and I think we need more data, right? We need to figure out, does this work? How does it work? Is it alternatives? Is, is, it, is, it, is, good, is it gonna work in conjunction with the medical assistant treatment programs for opioid use disorder or for kind of primary uh, healthcare needs? A lot of data out there, right? You guys are privy to this data uh, during your coding sessions and your hackathon sessions, but a lot of data out there. There's a lot of EMRs out there, right? I will tell you, from an end user perspective, the EMR doesn't work for me. It takes me away from the patients. I want the EMR to work for me. I know that's what you guys are striving for, but I, the electronic medical record can work for physicians and healthcare institutions. It would be amazing. We talked a little bit about MAT. Uh, I won't really um, belabor the point, but there's a number of different types of MAT, medical assistant treatment programs, primarily focusing on bup or buprenorphine, suboxone, whatever you want to call it, is, is what I think um, can be extremely helpful, and there's some um, national-wide measures to kind of head in that direction. So a lot of obstacles, right? A lot of obstacles, um, but we can overcome these obstacles. There's data, that, that people that don't talk to each other with data elements and so on and so forth. But what are the opportunities? I think in, in these obstacles there are opportunities. And here's a few opportunities from my perspective that I think may be helpful in, in some of your projects in bringing it to fruition. So EMR, so patient treatment and screening, how do we, how do we identify these high risk users? And how do we incorporate that in an EMR? There's a number of EMR systems. Can we develop some coding that can go into these EMRs at some sort of national level that then you know, the end users, hospitals can, can plug and play if need be? Instead of every single institution going in to these EMRs and then having their own analysts or programmers program something. So that's one thing. Reminders, automation, and integration. I think integration of data we've spoken about a lot. We have a lot of wonderful speakers here. I think that's extremely important. Um, although we have aggregate data available to us and we have scientists who are getting aggregate data, what about patient level data? Do I know that that patient that I saw that has 100 morphine do, uh, milligram equivalents of morphine and benzodiazepines is over the age of 65, if I actually reduce the number of prescriptions or morphine milligram equivalents for that patient, for those cohorts of patients over time, do I see a reduction in those patients specifically? in emergency department visits, hospitalizations, and deaths. That's extremely important for public health folks. Extremely important, surveillance data. Let's talk about mobile health technologies and wearables, um, a, a field that's, uh, uh, that's really exciting, whether it's apps, um, uh, wearables, how do we get early warning systems, the canary in the coal mine? How do we get people to adhere to medical assistant treatment programs or whatever it may be, get to their next appointment, develop a social network uh, that are of like users who, who can help each other out? Uh, these are really, really interesting opportunities. Um, that's my time. I know it's extremely short. I speak really fast, but uh, I think we're not taking questions, so thank you.